Thanks. <laughs> So for those who don't know me, my name is Eric Hurst. I'm the Hurst in the Aguiar Hurst kind of uh, component. It's a special day for me and Mark today. I don't know if he remembers, he never does, but it is our 24th anniversary of meeting to the day when we started at Chicago on January, or July 1st, 1999. And, and I can honestly say that I think Mark is by far the most impactful person in my professional career and early in the career, even more so. So we got to Chicago, for those of you who kind of know, we were off by ourselves quite a bit. Our officers were right next to each other. We spent a lot of time with each other. Now at that time, Mark was a student of Rudy Dornbush, working almost exclusively on international finance type issues. So we'd be sitting around talking. My eyes would glaze over with these words like, pass through in sovereign debt and those types of kind of things and again far enough but then we started bringing them a little bit more to the consumption side and I remember the first time we started our agenda together so 2001 Mark comes uh, we had a seminar John Skinner came and gave one of those retirement consumption puzzle papers basically expenditure falls at the time of retirement and it's an attack on the permanent income hypothesis because Retirement is relatively forecastable, and people should be smoothing through a retirement spell. And there was a tons of papers at this time. We saw one of them. And so we went to lunch one of those next days after the seminar, as we often did. We ate, you know, around the campus where there was good food. We were at the hospital. We were in the dorms where there was a burrito bar. We did that pretty much most days. So we went there. We were having burritos this day. And we were, I don't want to say making fun, but we were questioning a little the paper we saw the day before about retirement kind of falling. And then we t kind of were riffing a little bit about, you know, these older people were probably going to the early bird special, and that's why their spending was falling. And then we said, how would we test that? And so we decided, at that t again, at the same lunch, we really want to see food diaries of people relative to food spending of people. And we went back home, we went back to our office, in Google, for the younger people, Google did exist back in 2000. And we Googled um, the fact that, you know, where is it? Food diaries, nationally representative food diaries. And the Department of Agriculture was collecting these things. And so we ordered the CDs that afternoon that came like two days later and started our consumption versus expenditure uh, profile. Now, since that time, we have almost a dozen papers to each other trying to think about the, the, the non-market time. Mark asked me to keep this short because he hates very much um, and he gets uncomfortable with people saying nice things about him. He, he does not like it at all. But I'm going to take one minute now just to make Mark uncomfortable. So, <laughs> so coming from Michigan uh, where I got my PhD, I was trained very much in data work. My real graduate's training started when I got to Chicago and there I learned economics. And often by osmosis, I was learning price theory from sitting, you know, and listening to Kevin Murphy and Gary Becker and Bob Topel. Um, and it was just in the ether at that time. But Mark taught me economics and practice. And so if you take a look at those first few papers I wrote by myself, and then the ones that started with Mark afterwards, you could kind of see the, mod, you know, kind of combining model with data which is kind of what I think I do now, even in my papers without Mark, and many of my students are in the background, and what I try to teach in class. But none of that would have happened if I didn't um, get lucky enough to have start at the same time at Chicago with Mark. And so I am immensely grateful and immensely appreciative of having Mark Luckily, 24 years from today, be stuck in the same office next to me. I don't know if he feels the same, but <laughs> it, I could say it from my side. I am immensely grateful, and it is my pleasure to introduce one of my best friends in the whole world, Mark Aguiar, to give the plenary. Thank you, Eric. I'm going to need some advice on where to buy an anniversary present after this. <laughs> I, I did forget, and it's a little awkward. Uh, 
No, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, you know, as uh, Matthias was saying yesterday, the uh, SED is a special institution. It's a special thing. I've been coming also for like 20 years, and it's just a fantastic thing, and, and it takes a lot of work. So I'm very honored to have been invited to give the plenary, and I would like to thank Anmol and Pauline. I'd actually like to thank them for organizing the entire program. It's a huge amount of work, and it's just been a, an amazing three days. So I'd like to give Anmol and in spirit, uh, Pauline, she had a run, but uh, a, a, a round of applause for organizing a fantastic conference. I also would like to thank uh, David uh, Perez Reina and his team, who are the local hosts. The, he, David had this uh, vision about Cartagena many years ago, and he's pulled it off. It's a fantastic site, and I think it's it's uh, it's great to be here. I don't know where he is, but anyway, thank you. Uh, and and I should also give a shout out to the to the boss, Ellen, for being president of, of the society, and then Juan Paz joining her. So thank you guys, and uh, Marina and. Uh, Todd, do all the work apparently. Uh, so anyway, thank you to all of them. So anyway, it, it's, it's great and thank you Eric for the touching introduction. I need an introduction because probably you don't recognize me all dressed up. You know, I gave this practice talk to Karina and Christina Manuel in, in Minneapolis and there was this awkward pause at the end and they said maybe you better dress up. <laughs> so, so we'll give it a go. Anyway, the title of my talk is Micro Risks and Macro Policies, and I put this subtitle up there. It sounds a little mysterious, channeling Samuelson, uh, but it'll be very clear, I think. As a, I mean it in a very literal way. And also, I felt like after Matthias yesterday, he, he dropped all sorts of great names from Chicago and Minnesota. I had to throw a bone to the MIT crowd. So, I, so put Samuelson up there as well. All right, so I've been interested in inequality, like many of you, and like many of you, I think through the lens of incomplete markets models, and this is kind of what I mean by modern macro, and like most of you, uh, you know, the workhorse paradigm is the one developed by uh, Buley, Imerhoglu, uh, Huggett, and Iagari, and that's what I'm going to work with today, and it's familiar to all of us. There is a parallel tradition that goes back to Allais and Samuelson and Diamond on OLG models. And, you know, there's a particular type of inequality there, mainly young versus old. But there is also the failure of the welfare theorems, or potential failure of the welfare theorems. And we can learn a lot of lessons from those failures in thinking about uh, the Buley models. Okay, so that's what I'm, trying to, I'm going to try to do. All right, so once we, we uh, get to incomplete markets, uh, you gotta think about microheterogeneity because it's gonna be amplified potentially through the lack of insurance. And once you think about the microheterogeneity, it's really important to understand the sources. Uh, you know, some of this is due to shocks, idiosyncratic shocks. Some of it is due to market frictions. Obviously, lack of insurance is a big one. But there could be other ones. People might not have access to financial markets at all. People might have labor market uh, frictions. Uh, there could be preference heterogeneity that's driving some of the, the microheterogeneity. So I think we, we, uh, we really like to know a little bit about what are the underlying sources of this. Another branch that leads from incomplete markets is what is the appropriate macro policies to ameliorate the missing insurance markets. And once you're in the game of designing policies, you've got to set some rules. So one rule is what is the objective function? And I'd say by far most of us work with a utilitarian objective or some kind of weighted average of, of utilities. Uh, and that's a great approach because it picks out a point on the Pareto frontier. And that's great. But getting from where we are today to getting from to, to that Pareto frontier often involves huge amounts of redistribution. There's gonna be winners and losers. And you know we all love to channel our inner Bernie Sanders in doing these things, but politically it's just hard to see how some of this can, 
can be pulled off. So we could take an alternative, maybe a little bit less ambitious uh, approach and just ask, are there Pareto improvements over the current allocation? Okay, can, can we find Pareto improvements? And that's what I'm gonna do today. And then once we have our criteria, uh, we needed to write the rules for the tools. How complex or how simple are we gonna allow the government to do things? Okay, what kind of taxes and transfers and, and debt policy are we gonna allow? But the link between these two branches is that the macro policies have to be robust to the heterogeneity that I talked about at the top. Not only to the fact that there is such heterogeneity, but, but the fact that we don't know a lot about the sources or the magnitudes of all this heterogeneity. So we wanna design policies that, that recognize that we know we don't know a lot about what's going on at the, at the micro level of the economy. Okay, so that's my preamble, and I'm gonna talk about two lines of work, each of which uh, speak to one of these branches. So one of them is, uh, uh, with Mark Bills and Karina Bohr, who are the hand to mouth. Uh, the other one is with uh, Christina Ariano and Manuel Amador, uh, where we talk about robust Pareto improvements. Christina and Karina are in the audience. So it goes without saying that Mark and Manuel are responsible for all the errors that are gonna show up. Okay, so the paper with uh, Karina really think seriously in the, in the data about what does this inequality look like? Why do some households hold very little wealth? What is the source of this? And where does it matter? Okay. And then the AAA paper looks about simple policies. Thinking focused on government bonds is like a core component of this. And it's going to uh, exploit the fact that government bonds in the US so this is really kind of for uh, safe haven type economies, uh, trade at very low interest rates. And here we can leverage some insights from Samuelson. Okay, so when I mean Samuelson, I mean his OLG 58 paper and, and low interest rates. Okay, and then as I said, the link is we want these things to be robust. All right? Okay. You know, everybody's looking so tan and relaxed. I feel bad I'm gonna work yet, but yesterday Matthias reminded me that we're, we lack discipline. So, so I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna actually give you the model. But it's gonna be mainly uh, uh, muscle memory because it's Iagari, and this is the SED, and so everybody knows it. So I'm gonna breeze through it. I don't even know where to put this. Um, and just get you the notation but it's gonna, be, it's gonna be familiar. There's like one or two tiny wrinkles that I'll just flag as we go through, but you can, you can put it on autopilot for the next few slides. Okay, so think about uh, the household's budget set, an idiosyncratic household I. They're gonna have some consumption. They're gonna have uh, an asset, uh, uh, A, that they take into A, T plus one, they're gonna take it to the next period. They're gonna finance this with their labor income. There's some return to uh, efficiency units of labor, W, it's the equilibrium object. There's their idiosyncratic shock, Z, and then N is their labor supply. Then I'm gonna have profits potentially in the model. This is a bit of a wrinkle, and I'm gonna treat profits just like I treat labor income. You can't trade it, it's like, a, it's like an endowment of entrepreneurial ability. Capital, capital pi is the aggregate profit in the economy and then I get some share theta TI and that could have some process just like Z. So I'm treating these things symmetrically. Uh, then there's a return to your, to your assets and potentially some transfers. And then there's a borrowing constraint. And for the talk, I'm gonna put the borrowing constraint at zero. In the paper, we do more general. I'll just flag one or two points maybe where it matters. Okay, the preferences can be very general in many ways. We can have idiosyncratic uh, uh, heterogeneity in preferences. People can differ. They can have all sorts of things going on. Uh, for the talk, I'm just gonna focus on the case where there's no wealth effects on labor supply, so your GHH uh, preferences, but we extend it to, to uh, balanced growth preferences in the paper. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have a lot of generality we can put on this. We could even nest different cohorts by turning uh, utility on and off at different T's for different, for different people. Uh, so this can be fairly general. 
Technology, again, perfectly standard, constant returns to scale. Think of a representative firm that hires capital and labor. They uh, pay taxes on their factor inputs. So without, it's without loss that we're going to put the taxes on the firm side. So everything I showed you on the budget set of the household side is after tax, just to keep things clean. Okay, so here's like the one wrinkle is that I'm going to allow for markups. Okay, so think of a constant markup like a CES in the background. Uh, we're just putting a constant markup. And why do I want a markup? Well, per potentially there could be markups in the real world. Uh, but really what I want is a wedge between the marginal product of capital and the return on bonds. And we know that there is this wedge. And some of it could be, could be markups. Uh, it could be a convenience yield. We have an extension in the appendix that we do everything with convenience yields. You know, there are other ways to do it. You could have liquidity constraints on the entrepreneur's side. The one way we, we don't, those all nest, I think, pretty easily into what we do. We, one thing we don't talk about is risk. We don't have a risk premium. Not that we don't think about the risk premium is important. It's just that we have nothing really to say about the risk premium. The insights we have, I think, will carry over to a richer environment, but we don't want to get bogged down and, and be in asset pricing. I want to stick to plain IAGARI as much as I can. So with that, you know, the firms are just going to set their marginal product of uh, capital and labor equal to the prices. There's a wedge from taxes and a wedge from the markup. And then profits can be taxed. Okay, all these, these are the three linear taxes on capital inputs, labor, and profits. So very simple fiscal policies. And then there's a government budget constraint. They have to finance whatever transfers they give, uh, either through issuing debt or raising taxes. And then the equilibrium is standard. Asset market's clear, goods market's clear, uh, uh, labor market's clear. Uh, and so this is all plain Iagari. Okay, so that should be, uh, just, just to get it on the, on the table, everybody I think knows this model in their sleep. So now let's do something uh, different with it. Okay, so let me introduce our welfare metric, what we call robust parade or improvements. Okay, so now the typical way you would think about uh, parade or improvements would be to think about allocations. Can we find allocations that improve on the competitive equilibrium? Clearly in this model, at that level of generality, there are allocations that improve on the competitive equilibrium. We, there's all sorts of, of uh, inefficiencies in this, coming from the incompleteness of the markets. But the question we, we, we should answer is what allocations are feasible given simple instruments, right, these linear taxes, and what allocations guarantee a Pareto improvement with limited knowledge about the micro details of, of people's preferences, people's uh, shock processes, things like that. And we find that it's convenient then to work through equilibrium prices. Okay, so what is a robust parade improvement? Take the flow budget constraint from a, from a, a, a representative, I mean from a household I. Uh, I put in blue the returns to factors, right, and uh, you know, uh, capital, uh, wages, profits, and then the, any kind of lump sum transfer, all right? Think about a reference equilibrium. So let's say we're in some current equilibrium. I'm going to put this uh, uh, superscript O for original equilibrium. We're there. And I would like to find a policy that's going to raise these returns to labor, to saving, et cetera, uh, weekly at every date, and at least with one strict inequality. So look at the right-hand side of that budget set. Uh, this makes everybody have a bigger budget set and a flow budget thing. Now there is a question, what if A is negative, so they're borrowing. This is why you know, A lower bar does matter, but then we, we take care of it. And I, I won't go into the details, but we, we do we recognize the fact that a higher interest rate may not be good for borrowers. But aside from that caveat, everybody likes higher returns to labor, capital, and, and profits. Okay, so this is, if we can find such a, a sequence, uh, that's what we're going to call a robust Pareto improvement. So it's a little bit different than working through allocations, it's working through prices, but from the budget set, it's clear that people like this. And it's clear that people like this without having to worry about their utility functions. As long as they like more relative to less, they're going to like this. 
It's clear to all the, it, it's, it's robust to all the micro details about do I have a volatile Z process or a stable Z process? Am I risk averse? Am I impatient? Doesn't matter, it's giving you more stuff every period, in every state, every idiosyncratic state. Uh, you, you know, there's nothing to argue about. So this is what we mean by robust. It requires very limited information, okay? So let me just put it a little bit in context. It differs from the utilitarian metric. There's no redistribution, right? We're not taking from the rich or giving to the poor. Everybody, it's a Pareto improvement. Think about the seminal Iagari McGratton paper. Obviously, we're very closely related to that because we're going to be talking about government bonds in this. The, you know, the one way to think about that is the government issues a bunch of bonds, lump sum rebates, the proceeds to the households. Those who are unconstrained can save that against the future tax bills. They're almost Ricardian in that sense. Those that are constrained can spend it and then pay the future tax. And it's a way of getting around the borrowing uh, constraint in a sense because they're getting the payments up front and then they're paying the taxes later. But the paying the taxes later is what we're not doing. It's different than Davila, uh, Davila and all who look at the constrained efficient allocations with the utilitarian met metric. And there you can think about, let's distort relative factor prices towards workers. If they're the poorest agents, that's going to raise our objective function. That's a redistribution, and we're not doing that. It's different than Samuelson's Social Security. It's a great uh, policy. You tax the young, give it to the old. If there's population growth, let's say, you get a return that's unavailable in the competitive equilibrium. It's like a Ponzi game. It's a great idea, uh, but you do tax the young, and maybe they're constrained in this model, or, or maybe they can't, uh, don't like the trade at that, at that terms of trade. And it's different from your typical government insurance, like unemployment insurance, where you're taxed when you're employed and, you're, and you, you get money when you're unemployed. That's great, but we do need to know a little bit about your trade-offs across those states. Okay, so that's the robust Pareto improvement. Everybody gets more in every state. It sounds kind of crazy, right? It sounds like I'm a bit like Oprah. You're waiting for me to say, look under your seats, there's keys to your new car. Um, <laughs> Don't do it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, since this is the SED and we're among friends, I remember the, one of the early times I, I presented in Minnesota. I was on the first slide, and Tim goes, are you going to try to pull some East Coast bullshit here? <laughs> <laughs> and so I know that's what he's thinking. Uh, so you know, I'm giving everybody more all the time. How is this possibly feasible? So let, let's go. Okay, there's, no, there's not going to be any bullshit. Uh, let's think about the thought experiment. Start from a stationary equilibrium. This is for simplicity. Start from laissez-faire for simplicity. Uh, so, you know, everything is, uh, we're in a, a laissez-faire. There's no debt originally. There's no taxes. Um, and then at t equals zero, let's normalize, you know, to zero this date where the government announces a new path of fiscal policy. And after the announcement, there's perfect foresight. Okay, so everybody's gonna have to re-optimize. And I'm gonna focus on a subset of policies that can generate an RPI, the robust Pareto improvement, and I'm gonna look at the class that keep the wage after-tax wage constant and after-tax profits constant and focus on the interest rate and transfers. Really, the interest rate is what I'm interested in. That's gonna be the core mechanism, and that just goes back in some sense, to Samuelson 58. And because I'm doing GHH today, once I tell you the after-tax wage is the same, I can tell you I can clear the labor market at the original labor. That's going to be convenient as well. OK. So consider sequences. This bold uh, thing is an infinite sequence of interest rates and transfers. Remember, I'm keeping wages and profits constant. Uh, and I got to find sequences that I can implement as a competitive equilibrium with the simple taxes that I have. And that's what we're going to call feasible, OK? Um, and so I, I call this quasi-primal because it's a bit like the primal approach to a Ramsey taxation policy where you use the competitive equilibrium restrictions to, to narrow the set of allocations you can implement. I'm working with prices, so it's not quite the same, but, but we can do a bit of the same idea. 
And the first equilibrium object that's really important is this script A. Now think about when you saw Viagari on a computer or something where you, you, you feed in your guess for equilibrium prices, you solve every household's uh, optimization problem, and then you aggregate up and you get some aggregate asset position for the economy. That's my script A. And there's one at every T, and of course it depends on the entire sequence. This is a perfect foresight model. This script A is the core uh, object out of the household side that I would like to know. If I was in a representative agent model, I could just put the, Euler, the aggregate Euler equation there, but I can't, all right? Okay, so that, keep that in mind. That's the script A, and that's gonna show up all over the place. So here's a lemma to get us going on finding an RPI. I can find policy instruments, taxes and, and debt issuances, to implement a particular R and T sequence if these two conditions are satisfied. Uh, first is that I can find capital and debt issuances that satisfy the, the capital market, asset market clearing, that households want to hold this stock of wealth. That's pretty straightforward, that's the first one. The second one is a feasibility condition that I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, in the next slide. But just notice, there's no uh, heterogeneity or micro-heterogeneity that matters here other than through script A. That's the object, okay? That's really all I need to know from the household side. Okay, so let's, that second one, where does that come from? So uh, I did a little box to, to lighten things up. Uh, Think about what the firms produce in the initial equilibrium. That's the left-hand side. They produce some stuff. W0N0 is the household's labor earnings, after-tax labor earnings. They get that. Somebody's getting the profits. There's some payments to the rental market for capital. R0 plus delta times K naught. And then there's, there's a zero, which would be taxes, but it's laissez-faire, okay? And that's everything that's produced. This is where it all goes. Then in the new equilibrium, we have the same things. I've kept the wages the same and, and labor's the same. Uh, profits are the same. There's a new interest rate and potentially a new capital stock. So the payments to the rental rate of capital are different. Output could be different. And then we have taxes now, okay? And that tax box could be positive or negative. So keep that in mind. And then I can just take the difference from the initial equilibrium and say the change in taxes is just the change in output minus the change in what has to be paid in the uh, rental market for capital. That was that second condition. And the feasibility then becomes that those taxes and debt issuances have to cover transfers and debt payments. So it's pretty simple. Um, but I'm going to use that equation. An alternative from Valra's law, I work through the government budget constraint, I could work through the goods market clearing, is just think about the uh, goods market clearing condition, that script A has its counterpart as script C, the aggregate consumption. They obviously have all the same information, how much the household save, how much they consume. Uh, and I could work through that, and it's, it's compact, it's a little bit more mysterious maybe, but it's actually gonna help with intuition as well, is that whatever the households wanna consume, at that interest rate and transfer sequence is produced by the economy. And this is where the, the uh, restriction comes from that it's not, it can't be that everybody's just going crazy with their, with their newfound uh, uh, wealth, their, their budget sets. There's got to be a resource constraint. Okay, now that we got the map, we can go hunting for RPIs. So I'm going to do one that's very simple, and it has all the economics, I think, that, that, that uh, we need. Starting from the laissez-faire, I'm going to keep capital constant, okay? I'm going to think about the government engineering an increase in the interest rate from R0 to R prime. No transfers, right? There could be some surpluses. We're just going to throw them away for, for expositional ease if there are. Remember that uh, with, with the constant wage and the GHH, I can clear the labor market at the original wage. I don't need to have a distortion on the labor market. But I do need something on the capital market. There's a higher interest rate in this economy. Undistorted, firms would want to demand uh, fewer units of capital. But we've got to keep capital constant. So 
the government's got to subsidize capital at the firms. They've got to have an investment subsidy. How big is this subsidy? Well, we can use our formula. We have our change in taxes, output uh, change minus the factor payments, uh, the capital change. With constant K, a bunch of stuff's going to cancel out. Uh, there's the same amount of output. There's the same amount of depreciation. All that we're left with is the change in the interest rate times the initial capital stock with the minus. It's a subsidy. And this is exactly the wedge that I need to put in there to keep firms happy with the old capital stock while households are earning a higher interest rate. Okay? So we plug that into our feasibility condition. Now the change in taxes is, is just going to be this interest rate wedge times the initial capital stock. I can finance that. I've, I've set transfers to zero. I'm going to finance that with uh, debt issuances. And then let's just jump to the steady state because that's going to be the easiest way to explain all the economics. So set BT plus 1 equal to BT, and I'm left with this condition. Minus R prime B has got to be greater than or equal to this uh, tax subsidy. So this is the way we think about this. The left-hand side is seniorage. Now remember, this is, I should have mentioned at the beginning, there's no growth. We could add growth, it's the usual thing. Every time I say zero, you can think of G. Uh, it's a closed economy, obviously, it's Iagari. There's some seniorage that the, the government may get if R prime is negative or less than the growth rate, which I'll show you is kind of the norm. That seniorage has got to be enough to finance the tax subsidy. Okay. So everything uh, 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 about the economics of this is going to be in the canonical Iagari diagram. So on the horizontal axis is wealth and the capital stock. On the vertical axis is the interest rate. Uh, uh, this is, I don't know, this is probably figure one in Iagari. The downward sloping line is the firm's demand for capital as a function of the interest rate. There could be a markup, so it's not necessarily just the marginal product. Um, and then there's this upward sloping demand for wealth from the household side. Okay, so this should be very familiar. And the intersection of this is the laissez-faire equilibrium. This is where we're starting. Okay, we're happy there. What can we do better? Then we want to raise the interest rate. Okay? The way we can do that is by moving up the household's wealth curve uh, by issuing government bonds. Okay, so we're going to issue B, B prime, move up to R prime. And uh, we're at a new equilibrium. Our feasibility condition can be boiled down to these two rectangles. There's the seniorage component. The size of the debt issuance times the interest rate, which has got to be negative, that area is the revenue. What do we do with that? We've got to finance the tax subsidy. The tax subsidy for capitalists is R prime minus R times K0. That's the red rectangle. Immediately, you can see why I'm so interested in this script A. Feasibility depends on the elasticity of households with respect to the interest rate. How easy is it to get them to hold more wealth? Right? If it's very easy, this becomes uh, feasible. That's the elasticity I want to know. Uh, I don't need to know anything on the firm side. I don't need to know the, the elasticity of capital and output. I don't need to know the size of the markup or even if there is a markup. I don't need to know any of that. I just need to know how households as an aggregate will, or will, want a whole government bond. I don't, need, I don't care about the microheterogeneity beyond that elasticity. So it's, this elasticity is crucial. Okay, so that's our feasibility condition. Now let's talk a little bit about the economics. There's no additional output. Labor's the same, capital's the same. Everybody is richer. They have a bigger budget set. What's going on? The key is that everybody feels like they can consume more, but they don't necessarily want to. They have a higher interest rate, so the, think, the easiest way to think about this is that somebody with a big endowment this period says, I'm actually going to save a little bit more of this endowment because the interest rate is high. Somebody with a low endowment comes in with the bigger buffer stock and says, I can consume a little bit more than I, than I had in the initial equilibrium at this state. Those are the, the reallocations of the constant pi. That's the Pareto improvement. And it's all voluntary, OK? So it's all voluntary. There's no tax and transfers. Um, 
And, uh, um, you know, this is why I was saying that, that what really matters is this ability to, the willingness to save. All right, so Samuelson had this beautiful analogy. Everybody's born with a chocolate, it melts. They would like to consume it when they're old, but there's no one they can really trade with. All the, all the young have are the current old. Uh, they can't trade with them because they're, gonna, they're not gonna be around uh, when, when the current young are old. So what do you do? You give chocolate wrappers to the initial old, and they, for whatever reason, people are willing to give up their chocolates for the chocolate wrappers, and then you can improve on that allocation. All right, that was the, the, the start of this OLG money literature. This is the same insight, but it's different environment, I and mean, it's a little bit different. We need a government subsidy, but it is government pieces of paper. People want to hold a safe store of value, and the government is providing it, uh, and so there is this ability to improve the allocation. And the nice thing about an RPI is that there's no need to know the micro details beyond the script A. There's no need to know any of this other stuff. It's very, it's robust in the sense I, I, I wanted at the beginning. Okay, so this brings me, I think, to a nice way to think about government debt. There's two views, and they're obviously both at work in Iagari. Uh, I'd say the first view is Allen and Rouse and, uh, and Woodford. I, Woodford has a nice way of putting this. Government bonds take an illiquid asset, which is your claims on your future income, and through taxation, turns it into a liquid asset, government bonds. Okay, so it's very nice. Uh, Samuelson had a different view. He called it a social contrivance, which means making something out of nothing. And literally, in his model, it really it was just pieces of paper. Bonds are storage technology. They're not really a claim on anything. Right? If R is less than G, in his case it was just money, is R is less than G, it's not really a claim on anything, but they, they do uh, serve a purpose. So I think we're just trying to bring that, leverage that insight into a modern macro framework, and that, hence my subtitle. Okay, now we're not just replicating Samuelson. There's a lot more going on in this model that I think is important and that we've worked on in the last 50 years. Richer microheterogeneity. There's neoclassical production. So there's physical capital, and it's sensitive to interest rates. So we can't just, uh, uh, you know, Samuelson, a lot of the original OLG money literature was endowment economies. We have factor, two factors now, capital and labor, and there's a relative factor price that matters, okay? The key elasticity is this aggregate elasticity. Samuelson didn't have to worry about elasticities. You know, Velasco Shell uh, didn't have to worry about elasticities. Here we have to worry about aggregate savings elasticities. And it's the aggregate wealth elasticity. It's not the relative elasticity of money to bonds, or you know, it would be great if I could take um, Krishnamurthy and Vissing Jorgensen and say, okay, they've given me this elasticity. That's a relative elasticity. Uh, we need the aggregate wealth elasticity. And we need the government, okay? And we need the government because if we could have a private bubble in this economy, uh, in that sense. Um, but a private bubble wouldn't generate the revenue to offset the, the cap capital crowding out. Okay, so we were at, I was at this conference earlier in the week on fiscal policy uh, and, and um, Tim and Paulina were there. I said, what about an open economy? Now, how would this affect Colombia? This would be bad news for Colombia. They're the capital holders that are gonna be crowded out by having a higher US interest rate. The world benefits in a way by having a safe store of value but the proceeds from the seniorage need to be redistributed in order to make it a Pareto improvement in a global sense. We have a closed economy, but the same thing's going on. There's somebody holding capital. They need to be compensated with the seniorage, so a private bubble won't do that. You know, in the OLG, it's always the initial old who just reap this huge windfall. We don't care, but here we care who gets it. All right, some loose ends. Uh, so that, that's, that's the main economics, this elasticity. You're thinking, okay, but there's the transition and all the stuff that, that we harp on when some grad student is trying to do welfare analysis, looking at one steady state to another steady state. I, I'm aware I've done it. I've tortured my grad students as well. Uh, we've done the transition. And we have a very simple formula to do it, and it's the same idea, just done in kind of an intertemporal sense. Okay, so I'm just gonna walk you through the full thing 
but it's, you, know, you don't need to have to, to pay attention too, too dramatically because it's going to be the same economics. So first of all, we could move capital around. We don't have to do the constant K. Uh, what if capital's above the golden rule? So the marginal product of capital is below the depreciation rate, like diamond. We get the RPI there easily. Just like diamond, we, did, we, we gotta do a little bit more work, but it's the same idea. We got too much stuff saved, let's consume something. That's easy. The interesting case is the marginal product below the, uh, above the depreciation rate, uh, and that's why I needed this wedge, right, to talk about this. And this is, this, you know, isn't been a focus of any of the earlier literature in the, in the um, Samuelson tradition. Okay, so let me just do one perturbation. Uh, there's some period tau in the future. The government's going to raise that one interest rate. So I'm just going to do a simple perturbation. There's squiggle, T sub tau, C maybe, zeta, I don't know, C, let's call it. Uh, actually, Rudy Dornbush always called it uh, squiggle. That's where I got it from. So, you know, he came from Michigan thinking that MIT guys knew everything. We didn't get taught anything either. I had to sit with, sit with Becker for a year before I knew any price theory. Um, okay, so squiggle is the elasticity of savings at time t given an interest rate perturbation at time tau. Okay, and there's one for every period. This is what these uh, young cats, uh, Ludwig and Adrian and uh, Matt, talk about the sequence space uh, Jacobians. This is what they're talking about, these, the sequence of elasticities, and they get this slick way of computing them. And we actually use that in some of our numerical stuff. All right, but this is the thing they're talking about. It's really a directional derivative in the direction of R tau. Then the sufficient condition becomes all these elasticities. I just need the present value to be bigger than one. I don't need everyone, like in the steady state, to be bigger than one. I just need this that the, on average they're bigger than one. And what is the averaging weight? It's the marginal product of capital. Not the interest rate on government bonds, that thing would blow up. It's the marginal product of capital because technologically that's the true intertemporal terms of trade. That's what the economy as a whole trades at and the government understands that. So if this discounted sum of elasticity is big enough, uh, we get the RPI. And so you could have a period where the, you know, maybe the initial period, the elasticity is very small. You know, people take time to build up a buffer, uh, their new buffer stock. Uh, but then as long as it's big in the future, but not too far in the future, uh, we can use debt and capital to, to bridge that gap. And so at the end of the day, that's what I was saying, the economics at the end of the day is that we just need people to be elastic with respect to the interest rate sometime and often enough. Okay? All right. All right, how big is this elasticity? You know, it would be great to, to, to just uh, pull it out of the data, but it's a little bit tricky. So we've done a couple of things. There's, a, the, there's a cal all sorts of calibrations we've done. We've looked at all sorts of parameter configurations. Kind of our benchmark, we try to, to do a, a typical calibration, and we increase debt by 60% of GDP. The interest rate increases by about 40 basis points in the short run and 30 basis points in the long run. Translated into elasticities, they're big. They're big in the short run, they're big in the long run, okay? People in these models want to hold wealth, safe stores of wealth, and very elastically. We, and as I said, we've looked at all sorts of parameterizations. Are large elasticities plausible? This is what a calibrated model looks. I'll just give you one piece of data, which we're all familiar with. So Neil Marotta, who I saw around, but uh, was nice enough to give me this from his very nice paper. Uh, this is like 100 plus years of the US uh, ex fiscal experience. So the red line is US debt to GDP, and the dashed line is R minus G minus N, so R relative to per, per capita income growth and, and in population growth. And obviously big wars happen and we, dry, we drum up the debt, Debt's a stock variable. Decades later, we still have a huge amount of debt. Long after the war is over, the interest rates never show any kind of clear indication of, of, that this debt overhang is a problem uh, to absorb by the households. There's really no correlation here. If anything, it's maybe a little negative. There was this literature in the 90s that were doing VARs and, and, and trying to estimate 
the impact on interest rate of, of, uh, of government bonds, again, the identification's tricky. People like Valerie know how to handle this kind of stuff. Uh, they found estimates that uh, you couldn't really reject zero. Like the Ricardian equivalence would be zero. That doesn't matter. Uh, it just seems to be elastic. And that's, that's uh, important for what we're trying to say. Okay. So take, let's taking stock of this. Higher R and more B facilitate risk sharing. There's a willingness to delay consumption when times are good, maybe, and, and, and consume when times are bad. As I said, I don't really need to take a stand on whether that, that's actually going on, but it's a, good to keep in mind. It is the central prediction of the buffer stock savings model, right? And this is the backbone, the Carol Deaton, uh, et cetera, of, um, of Iagari and all of our, our incomplete markets models, which begs the question, do people actually behave this way? Right? Do the data say anything about how people behave, and does that tell us anything about microheterogeneity? So let me talk about the hand-to-mouth paper. And you can understand what we're going to do through the Euler equation. Right? So again, this is an equation that we all know in our sleep. And I put the inequality sign there because people could be constrained. Standard power, power utility preferences, sigma is the intertemporal elasticity of substitution. Um, and you can think about this in a, in a log normal case. You can just, just write this explicitly. And on the left-hand side, I put, what does this person expect their consumption growth to be between today and tomorrow? On the right-hand side, we have beta relative to R, and how impatient they are relative to the interest rate, and that's intermediated by the IES, right? Hence, hence that's why it is the temporal elasticity of substitution. And then there's a precautionary term, right? Uh, my, my consumption's volatile. I don't have insurance. I got to save. The bigger that variance is, the more I'm going to save, right? And so my consumption will be a steeper profile. So constrained as households have high consumption growth and, and an expectation for two reasons. One is they could really be up against the constraint, so we have an inequality in that Euler equation. But two, they're facing a lot of volatility in their consumption. They need to build up their buffer stock. So that's the second reason why they're going to have faster consumption growth. OK, so what do the data say? And whether this holds or fails, does that tell us something about preference heterogeneity or other sources of microheterogeneity? OK, so we take the PSID. We break households up by how much wealth they have. We define hand to mouth. Uh, following Zeldis, classic paper, as having very low net worth relative your, to your labor earnings. Okay, so, so net worth less than two months of labor earnings. We have an alternative version that has the wealthy hand to mouth um, based on Kaplan Violante, uh, but I'm going to just focus on the poor hand to mouth and what I'm going to say. So there's a lot of these guys, almost a quarter of the sample. As you, as you probably know, there's just a huge fraction of the population that just don't hold buffer stocks. Fact one, hand to mouth status is very persistent. If you're hand to mouth today, two years from now, because the PSID is uh, every two years, you have a 65% chance of still being hand to mouth. Four years, 58%. And this is with all the measurement error on wealth that we have in the PSID. So there's, there's artificial transitions here. Uh, that, uh, so I take this as a lower bound on the persistence. You can go kind of like a, a longer run thing. 53% of the households are never observed to be hand to mouth at all every year we see them in the sample. Well, almost 10%, they're always hand to mouth. Here's the histogram of the frequency of hand to mouth. So every, every household, we can look how often are you hand to mouth relative to how many times do we see you in the survey. So 100%, one is like, as I said, 10%, and zero. Is, is, a big, is a big fraction, and as I said, it's bimodal. There just seems to be two types of households, just kind of an eyeball conjecture. Let's go to this core prediction of the buffer stock. You're supposed to be saving your way out of the low wealth regime, right? You're supposed to be understand that this is a high volatility place to be, and you want to get out of it, and the way to get out of it is through precautionary savings. 
do the people who are low on precautionary savings today have faster consumption growth in the future on average? Right? So we can, we can calculate that, the conditional uh, growth of consumption. We have a whole bunch of controls in these things. And there's just no effect, okay? There's just no correlation between your asset position and your anticipated growth, or anticipated means the realized average of your group, okay? But that's without fixed effects. That's pooling everybody, as if everybody writes ex ante identical except for their wealth positions. When we put in household fixed effects, we see the standard prediction show up. They do have faster growth. So what does that mean that, that, that the fixed effects matter so much? Those that are often hand to mouth, they do uh, have a buffer stock behavior, but it's not big. They're not going somewhere where the mean household is going relative to income. They're kind of moving around at a much lower target of buffer stock behavior. So the frequently hand to mouth are just behaving differently than those uh, in the cross section that typically aren't hand to mouth. And so, so that's uh, a fact about these guys. More facts. The persistently hand to mouth. So if you just look at how frequently people are hand to mouth and asking those that are frequently hand to mouth what does your lives look like, they have more volatile consumption, more volatile income. They make different static decisions over the types of goods they buy. And they have different dynamic choices on the extensive margins. They're frequently going in and out of categories. Their lives are rough. I mean, it's rough sailing in this hand to mouth uh, uh, subsample. They're facing a lot of volatility and they don't save their way out. There's this great kind of sociological uh, thing, these US uh, financial diaries, they interview a little over 200 households and ask them about their struggles uh, uh, saving. And here's one of the punchlines, is that the paradox is that the very people who need a buffer of savings are often the ones who have the hardest time creating it. They just don't do it. Even some of these cases, they have seasonal employment. They know they're going to have a high income and low income in periods and they don't smooth through. Okay, we're just finding that in the full representative sample. Um, and it's not just confined to, it's not just poverty. We've dropped the bottom uh, quartile, I think, of, of, permanent, of their permanent income households, and we still find the same pattern. So it's not just being poor. All this is relative to your income. Okay, so what can we make of this? Well, we feed it through a structural model. We use Kaplan Violante's econometrical model, and it's nice for, for this following reason. They have two assets, a liquid asset and an illiquid asset. And the IES tells you about a preference for liquidity. The IES, remember, is do I care about the timing of my consumption? Do I care whether, I, do I do, am I willing to delay if the interest rate is high, if I'm willing to move forward, if my interest rate is low? And that tells you something about um, your demand for liquidity. We have Epstein's in. We can separate this from risk aversion. We talk about risk aversion in the paper as well. We talk about other sources of heterogeneity. As I said, income volatility, interest rate, risk aversion. But anyway, I'm going to focus on the beta, the discount factor, and the IES. Those seem to be core to what, what we find. So we can do this. And we calibrate the model to match a whole bunch of moments. Um, you know, moments that are typically aren't even uh, targeted in this literature. I mean, everybody targets like kind of mean wealth to income or things like that. We target a bunch of, we, we hit the median, uh, and I'll show you which one is important in a second. We find the vast majority of households are just regular macro households. Beta R close to one, low intertemporal elasticities. We have three types at the end of the day. But two of them are kind of similar in this way. And then there's this other type. 22% are just impatient, a beta of 0.72 annually, and they're very elastic, IES of 2.9. There are 22% of the population, they're 84% of the hand to mouth at any given time. So these are just different, and the hand to mouth are just uh, different types, okay? That's the, that's the way that we interpret the microdata through the lens of kind of these standard models. The crucial moment, which as I said is not a usual one, is this consumption growth regression. I already told you how important it is for understanding buffer stock behavior, and we want to match these things, 
with and without the fixed effect. And that turns out to be very informative. Um, okay, so we get these types. Let me just say one or two words about where it matters. The, the impatient type, let's just call them the impatient type, they have a high MPC. They like consuming whatever they have. If we could have a label on everybody's head, I'm the impatient type, I'm the patient type, and I wanted to do targeted transfers, I would target these guys. Of course, we don't have that label, but we know where they hang out. They hang out in low wealth region. In fact, they're almost always there, okay? So if you think that um, MPCs uh, vary with wealth, when you add this kind of, uh, what we find to be uh, this preference type heterogeneity, it amplifies it. And then I'm comparing the MPC by wealth quartile. The red lines are the baseline. The blue lines are the single type. Everybody has the same beta sigma. We match the same moments as best we can. They both get a gradient with respect to wealth, but the single type is actually mainly in the top quartile of wealth. The heterogeneous types, it really focuses on these poor because they're the ones that are different. And 84% of the heterogeneity and just the cross-section of MPCs um, are due to this type. It's not due to the asset position per se. In the model, I can see your type, and that's really what I would like to target. Okay, so let me return back to this idea of a Pareto improvement. There's rich heterogeneity in the data. It's a challenge to policy, it calls for robustness. For the existence of an RPI, I didn't need to know all this heterogeneity, I just need to know this aggregate er uh, elasticity. And for this aggregate elasticity, these, these always hand to mouth guys don't matter. They're never in the asset market. They don't really affect it. But it kind of uh, um, tells us a little bit about who's really benefiting from our RPI. There's two legs to the policy. One is you issue the bonds and then you transfer. Here we just do a, a lump sum transfer in our, uh, in our paper. Uh, that's great for the hand to mouth, right? They're impatient, they, they, they would like to consume, they might be constrained. Um, that's great. But thereafter, it's the savers that benefit. They get the higher interest rate. So this is just like a partial equilibrium welfare gain, just to give you a sense. I took the kaplan violante model, we computed it. It's a life cycle model. We looked at when you're born, what your welfare is. On the horizontal axis is different interest rates, right? There's no aggregate um, change to the interest rate. This is why it's partial equilibrium. I'm not clearing the asset market at these interest rates. I'm just saying this household faces a minus 2% interest rate. This household faces a 1%, et cetera, across the horizontal axis. You're born there. Do you like being there or do you not? And we have these types. If you're the impatient type, you don't care. You're hand to mouth. You're always hand to mouth almost, as in the data. Uh, if you're a saver, you love this high interest rate. So it is a Pareto improvement. The high to mouth don't care. Their, their, their wage income hasn't changed in a robust Pareto improvement. Uh, but the savers are the ones who benefit, okay? So it's not like uh, we should lose track of who wins and who loses. Everybody weekly gains, but there are certain elements of this policy that, that favor savers. Okay, so to conclude, there's room for Pareto improving policies when R is less than G. You need to make sure that there's not some factor price movements that's distributional, that makes some people better off or worse off. Um, how is this feasible? You gotta know whether the aggregate elasticity is big enough, okay? And I give you some sense that we think it might be big enough, but this stuff just exists in the world because people wanna hold safe assets. It avoids explicit redistribution, it can be extended to monetary policy. So Manuel forced me to write a new Keynesian paper. We have a Phillips curve. I'm, I'm, and that was the confessional part of the talk. We do this in monetary policy. And basically, the, we do the, an RPI. And the monetary authority just has got to get out of the way of the fiscal authority. Don't follow the Taylor rule. That's the worst thing you can do. Uh, you got to just get out of the way of the fiscal policy. But it's no panacea. There's this 20%, 25% of the population, and maybe if you're utilitarian, those are the ones you really care about. They're persistently hand to mouth, 
they're, they're not hurt, but they're not helped by this. They're sensitive to the transfers, so they're helped by that, but most of the, you know, the gains in the longer run are just a higher interest rate, and they don't really uh, uh, benefit from that. So I'm not saying this is where we stop, right? I'm just saying this is a, an easy beginning given the world the U.S. lives in. As I said, the open economy, there are issues, but given the world the U.S. lives in and other countries that seem to be able to issue stores of value that are safe, um, this is kind of a, 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 an easy first step. Thank you. Guy from Miami Vice, you keep that. <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I just, it was not a question, I was just to ask for a reflection oh, on... I got my final slide. This one took me Ah, okay. Uh, that's what I was telling you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, you made it clear and said, okay, this is about a particular privilege if you have the ability to... Yes. Uh, how do we know when, when that's the limit? How do when, you know what? How do you know how much can you push it oh, until it so stops stop being safe? And um, yeah, and that's something I should have mentioned uh, with my Igari diagram. Um, sorry, back, going back to. Okay, so the core thing is: Are people willing to hold these assets at low interest rates? We have to, you know, already you can see that I have this cost. So Blanchard talked about, and his presidential guest talked about the blue button thing, right? There's just this money. And if you think about, let's go to the peak of the Laffer curve of that money. That would be maximizing the blue rectangle. We got to stop long before that because there's distributional consequences to this. This is what Blanchard left out of his presidential address. There are winners and losers to this policy. Uh, and without these offsetting things, um, we don't know whether this is a good idea or not, unless you take a stand on, on welfare across individuals. So we got to stop long before that. Um, but how far can we push it? Well, it's how elastic is this thing, right? Obviously, the flatter this thing is, the less R increases for the amount of debt that's being raised. Um, you know, and again, you know, this is this is a simplified environment to get the insights. There's obviously shocks and stuff. And so you have to think a little bit about what happens when R goes positive. So, you know, it's not a quantitative thing that you can go to 120% of debt to GP. Obviously, there's a limit to this. Um, yeah. Hey, Mark. Um, quick question. In a world where you have the hand to mouth uh, in debt, should we have to carry an A for an aggregate A for the, for the savers and aggregate A for the net uh, borrowers? Yeah, perfect. That's a good point. So. I put the borrowing constraint to zero for the talk, and I had these R prime minus R's times K, K naught as the cost. It's really K naught minus the borrowing constraint, plus however you want to assign it. It's bigger, because we have to compensate the borrowers. So it's a little bit of a higher threshold. And that's just with lump sum transfers. If we were allowed a nonlinear tax where we could um, uh, subsidize borrowing, then it would be an easier thing to do. But we do have to. And I'm not thinking about, okay, somebody's leveraging, I'm not thinking about Elon Musk, they leverage out the wazoo to buy Twitter. Let's think about normal human beings and just think, okay, people do carry debt and there is this cost to having a higher interest rate, there might need to be a subsidy there. Know that? Uh, for, for the hand to mouth paper, yeah. is, does it matter or can you tell the difference if well, okay, through your model, you're interpreting the never, uh, sorry, the always hand-to-mouth guys as high, high impatience, but couldn't you have like something like Stone-Gary preferences so that the preferences, 
these guys have to like always consume a lot because they're like close to subsistence levels? Beautiful, yeah. So um, we don't actually do that in the calibration, but we do do that in an appendix where we talk about why, what could be the micro foundation for a high intertemporal elasticity of substitution? And we think of people having heterogeneous subsistence, like what is the minimum consumption? And if you're close to that, uh, and we think about the extensive margin, do you buy this good or do you not? And they have different, some are necessities, some are luxuries. Being close to those thresholds make you very elastic. This is an old idea about uh, non-convex choices, right? When you're close to a SS band or whatever, you become extremely elastic. And that was our interpretation is these people, you know, they got to pay their rent, but there's something um, uh, just a step above that they're going in and out of. I should say in the financial diaries has some great anecdotes. I mean, what do they save for? These guys save for their first month's rent. They want to move out of their parents' basement. That was the topic of Eric's plenary talk, these guys in the parents' basement. They want to move out of their basement. They want to get a first month's rent. They're not saving for retirement. They're not saving for the long run. They build up a stock of savings for a very specific reason, and we see that. 